Hello and welcome to the Womb Garden podcast for episode one. Um, Yay! Hey, Menarda is here with me. And Menarda is a, a garden buddy who gardens. Where, where are you located with your gardening? Um, I'm located uh, on Anishinaabe land in northern Wisconsin, right on the shores of Lake Superior. So Bayfield, Wisconsin is the town I call home. And it's pretty like cold climate. You know, it's not cold all year round, but it doesn't get above 90 really in the summertime. And we're in April now, but it looks like you have a fairly sunny day. Yeah, this is the second sunny day in a row after two weeks of cold and cloudy and no sun. <laughs> well, I am in Clear Lake, California, which is in Northern California on Pomo uh, territory land and on the shores of Clear Lake. So we're both uh, lake dwellers. Mm -hmm. um but uh and um i hope this wind isn't too much for the speaker how is the wind it's it's windy but it's okay you can still hear me and understand yep so um i wanted to i had this idea to create this womb garden podcast with Menarda where we could share about how gardening uh, nourishes our our womb our creative center and um, and also about herbal medicine gardening and herbal medicines that we can grow ourselves that um, nourish the womb specifically and other other things that we can grow to to nourish ourselves and um, for, uh, for, you know, womb wellness and feeling our creative juices flow. And so we thought for this first episode, we could do a garden tour um, and look at the water element in California, it's, um, Northern California, you know, preparing for the, the drought years and the fire season is really important um, for that sense of feeling like, you know, I can even just be here and, and survive and live. So we've been evacuated from due to wildfires in our area for five years in a row. And we moved to an area that hasn't been evacuated like that, but you just mm -hmm. never know what, what new area is going to be the next area. And so um, we are having quite a drought year. We haven't had rain in a number of weeks and the temperatures are rising all of our fruit trees are leafing out and um, I'm having to really pay attention to getting everything in our, you know, food forest, orchard, garden, uh, enough water to be able to be fruitful. And so um, today I watered the orchard with the gray water from the washing machine and I wanted to take it, give Menarda and, and listeners a tour of that, um, gray water system that that um, that watered the orchard today and a little tour of the garden as well um how's that sound Minarda? that sounds great so we're looking at the water element and i'll just hold that in my in my mind and in my body while you go and you know just just allowing for us to be inspired by that element the element of you know, allowing and, um, and moving freely and meandering. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's exactly. And, it's, and the flow of our emotions too. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, no. um, appreciating, you know, thinking about where you're at and where I'm at and the season that I'm in, right? Because you're in this, you just described the season that you're in and the season that I'm in is, is still spring, right? It's still the time where everything is waking up and usually we have a lot of water, an abundance of water and we don't have an abundance of heat yet. 
Um, and it's also, it, you know, for me, it feels like it's a time of waiting. Um, there's on when on sunny days, I'm like, Oh, I can't wait. I just need to get out and stick my hands in and pull weeds and, you know, continue to like dream and pay attention and think about how I want to move beds around. Um, but I also feel like I have to wait for a lot of what I want to do because we're going to have frozen nights until the beginning of June. And I feel like, you know, we, I feel like waiting there, there's definitely an element of water and waiting as well as an element of earth. So yeah, let's yeah. see your well, I just wanted to say that, you know, the waiting is quite difficult here because we often have very warm spring weather in February, March, and April, sometimes even in January, but we know there's still going to be frozen nights. And we just mm -hmm. passed the last estimated frost date in the middle of April. So we just passed that date. And there was actually a frost warning for just... Mm -hmm. um, Thursday night. So I put my tomatillo inside the frost blanket that I have around one of the red, mm -hmm. uh, raised beds and I hadn't planted it in the ground yet for that reason. Um, but here we are past the frost date and I'll just give you a quick tour. I'm gonna turn my video around, hopefully. There we go. Okay, so this is our um, front of the house garden and we have some wonderful herbs growing here there's chamomile this is roman chamomile so the mm. it's very the le the foliage is very aromatic um have a few uh, mystery weeds in there we've got costmary and oregano and um that is a chinese chrysanthemum. We've got at the base of this beautiful plum tree here where you see, I don't know if you can see the plums there. Glasses on. Yeah, there's a little baby plum. You can see it in there. And there's quite a few on this tree getting ready to ripen. And down here at the base of the tree, with Monarda's advice, I'm starting to convert this orchard from monoculture where the previous owner had suppressed all other plants and only had trees growing to a more of a permaculture where there are other plants growing in community with the trees and every plant has its its role in the ecosystem of the garden and so we've got comfrey growing down on the ground here we've got yarrow growing down on the ground here. Ladies mantle, two ladies mantles growing and they're coming out nicely. Um, these are all wonderful herbs for womb wellness and overall wellness. Over mm -hmm. here we have more chrysanthemum, we have cleavers, which some people consider to be a weed. This is <laughs> cleavers here. This is the chrysanthemum. And the cleavers is sort of within the chrysanthemum growing. Um, but the cleavers is really lovely for a gentle spring liver tonic. Um, we've got feverfew, which some of you may know as, uh, that's really helpful for migraines and re reducing overall inflammation. We've got lemon balm, which is really excellent for digestion and um, relaxing the nervous system and lots of other things, re restoring our original DNA blueprints and things like that, activating our bliss DNA. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, um, favorite. Um, and Lady's Mantle is, you know, if you think about him, get out of the, if you think about that term and look at the shape of the leaf of the Lady's Mantle, that of, there's, something oh the other fruit tree is shading this lady's mantle if you look at the shape of the leaf it's like a a cloak that you might wear around yourself if you could imagine that leaf shape and there's a shape there's a place where your neck and head could go and you could be wearing if it was big this leaf around like a cloak and it's very protective um 
of, and nourishing and um, tonifying plant for wound wellness. And then I we want to. I want to. Sh- I want to share um, a magical and magical ritual around okay. Lady Thistle. Um, one of the traditions is that on on Beltane morning, um, you would wash your face with the water that the ladies mantle leaf captures because ah. lady, mm-hmm, ladies mantle leaves um capture and capture water and, and and concentrate them into um droplets uh-huh and so on beltane morning um taking some of those droplets and washing your face i sometimes will will drink the water from the ladies mental um ladies mental leaf um for, and, and you for can those- kind of see how on this plant you can see how the the, the leaf co- going upward would collect water there mm-hmm. in the middle. The lower leaves that are more open might not collect it so nicely, but these ones that are just coming up and not quite as open might collect it, collect a little bit more dew in there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'd have to come out pretty early though uh, <laughs> to catch it here because it dries out pretty quick. <laughs> That's what I was just thinking too. You know, I was thinking like, you know, Beltane is a specific holiday that's celebrating a specific season. And, you know, for those of us who live in different areas and regions and where the seasons are slightly different, you know, there's different ways of marking marking these, these holy days. I, you know, for instance, like one of the the traditions around around Imbolc, which or Candlemas, which is the beginning of February, that's tradition. Like that, that holy day was about the beginning of spring, and spring for me doesn't start until so, um, equinox. So, you know, it's it's kind of this like these rituals where we're we're invited to honor them and mark them as feels appropriate for us, and one nice guiding guidance. Um, that we can use is the moon phases and you know just kind of noticing when the moon is full or when the moon is new and crafting a ritual that's appropriate for whatever season you're in then right so right um, so for me it might be easier to collect water in ladies mantle at candlemas in february when there still (laughs) might even be some rainfall and it's not so warm that the water is evaporating right away Um, whereas for you uh, if you had ladies mantle growing and you wanted to do that ritual, it might not even be big enough until later, even after Beltane. So, yeah, if I can, I, if I can switch, I can figure out how to switch my camera. I can show you my ladies mantle. <laughs> oh, okay. You should, if you click on the screen, you should yeah. have a little method. There we go. Right oh, okay. There's my ladies mantle. Just to give All you some. Right. And they, so there's a mullen back here, which is quite large, but yeah, the lady's mantle is tiny and it should be bigger. It should be, I, I have captured or, you know, gathered water from lady's mantle on Beltane. So. And I Beltane is, is around May 1st, right? No, no, yeah. that's May Day. It's yeah, yeah, around but, there. Yep. Same. So Beltane okay. and May Day, same holy day. Um, okay. But I think that the different pagans celebrate it differently. Um, you can celebrate it on the day. You can celebrate it whenever your family celebrates it, um, mm-hmm. which is usually how how we do it. Um, mm-hmm. But I try to I try to mark it personally for my magical rituals around the full moon. So the holy days that are um, the holy days that are between, like in the summer seasons. So Beltane and Lamas, which is the beginning of August, those would have been. I mean, historically, people say they celebrated them on the full moon, whereas the one winter would have been celebrated on the new moon. Mm-hmm. But, you know, recreating rituals, like we just have to do what's right for us and our right. family, and our beloveds. Yeah. And to me, it, it's, I know that there is some magic about tapping into like a certain astrological event, but my life isn't put together that way that I, that I can focus that much energy on that. Right, right. All right, so shall we carry on with the, yes. with the tour? Yes. Okay, so um, down here, 
next to the ladies mantle I was showing earlier, we've got St. John's wort mm. starting to make its taller branches that will usually flower um, in May sometime, depending on the year. Um, Saint, it's, it's called St. John's wort and I call it St. Joan's wort because it tends to bloom on St. John's day, which is usually, I think like June 21st or something like that. But where I live, it, it blooms um, usually much earlier than that. So, uh, and it's um, really lovely for um, all kinds of things. Some people use tinctures of St. John's wort to help with uh, balancing out the emotions and restoring the nervous system from trauma and, and um, depression. And I, I love it topically for um, pain and, and restoring damaged nerve tissue in the body. So there's a wonderful friend, St. John Swart. And more of this, um, this is the Chinese um, chrysanthemum. Uh, several more patches of that and more comfrey back there. So these are the two um, permaculture beds that uh, inspired by Menarda's um, support to move away from the monoculture orchard. Um, and this, this is around the persimmon tree, which doesn't have blooms, but is quite leaf out and mm. Uh, produces persimmons in the fall. Um, mm -hmm. Over here we have a couple of fig trees and there's my raised bed with wonderful food in it, spinach and oh. uh, lettuce and <laughs> chives and uh, calendula, which is really great. Mm -hmm. Boy, I really need to harvest this spinach, huh? <laughs> Mm -hmm. bloom. I've got kale in there, all kinds of wonder and onions. So, um, and then the figs. Let me see if I can find a baby fig to show. Um, <laughs> they come out. The little figs come out very early. I'm not seeing one on this tree. Mm. Maybe there's one on this other tree. Usually they come out, I'm finding out the, the, the little new figs come out with the first leaves, but not mm. on these two trees. Um, mm. You know, I've got several different varieties of figs, mm. but I'll show you on another fig. Um, it's so well, what seeing figs in the ground. I have figs that I keep in pots that, um, oh, yeah. that are, you know, they're less than three feet tall. They're probably two and a half feet tall. And I, keep, I divide them every year and I give them away, but we get like, we get 20 plus figs a year from two very small trees. And oh, I just, wow. it's like, I love fresh figs so much that <laughs> it's totally worth it to yeah. have luxury and to keep these. Plants. I'm not, a, I'm not very much of an indoor plant person. Like I have, I also have a lemon tree that I, oh, that flower is beautiful. Yeah. Well, can you see the, um, the little baby peach oh trying to zero in on the baby peach it's kind of the lighting's not quite right here but yeah. uh, I, have teeny, I have a teeny screen you can make it bigger if you click on my video feed it'll fill up your screen but it's not focusing where i want it to focus <laughs> but that's a baby peach and over here we have they, uh, this is a nectarine tree I found, figured out. Wow. Oh. You can see that little nectarine there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> on it. Um, so there's all these trees and I have more plants like roses and um, this uh, marshmallow is from mm. seed that you sent me in the mail, Monarda. <laughs> I've already been harvesting off of it, but I'm growing it in a pot so I can harvest the root. Cool. I've got all kinds of other herbs in pots here. I've got some catnip, and these will are getting ready to go in the ground around these other trees. Um, I've got some 
um, hyssop uh, growing in the pot here that needs, and I've got clary sage growing mm -hmm. in the pot, another rose, um, more clary sage, some culinary sage getting ready to bloom. Uh, oh. Rosemary got in the ground. Oops, let me get my shadow out of the way. Here's the lovely rosemary in the ground. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> and roses are getting ready to bloom here. I don't know if you can see those blossoms, but guess what? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That oh, is beautiful. My Don Juan rose. But I have a whole row of roses, different colors right here. And there's my mullein is in a pot. <laughs> Oh, and look, my lemon balm finally is starting to leaf out. It's one of the slowest ones, but look, oh. there's lemon balm leaves. Lem lemon verbena? Lemon verbena, that's what I mean. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> lemon awesome. verbena. <laughs> Ooh, that's exciting. Yeah, so I've got lots of planting to do. There's some, some geraniums down there and um, a clematis and some irises that are all waiting to find their spot and yeah. oh here's oh guess what this is wow those are you know what that is? no i don't it's lilac that was what i was gonna guess i was like i think those are lilacs yeah cool. and they're, they're getting ready to pop the one at the very top has popped Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard to see it. And then we also have a bunch of blueberries through here that you can see. And there's blossoms mm. starting to pop in. See those blueberry blossoms? Yeah. Oh, they're so beautiful. Blueberry. So as mm. we know, blueberries are very healthy for us. And then we have blackberries growing here, thornless blackberries growing on this trellis here, as you can see, leafing out. And I've got three trellises worth of these thornless blackberries, which I'm super oh. excited about. And I'm gonna plant my um, red raspberries. Mm. Uh, now, but they're going to go in there too. And then um, I have another fig here in a pot. Oh, and here we go. This is the first fig over here. Two potted figs here. And this one has. Ooh, yeah, there they are. Little figs. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, Salma, how long yeah. have you been growing herbs um, for medicine? And, and then how long have you been growing food? Oh, my goodness. 25 years? More than that. I started as, as a youngster um, <laughs> growing. My first plant that I grew tried to grow was a... Um, I'm trying to switch the camera back around to tell you this. Uh -huh. story. There we go. Yeah. My the first plant that I tried to grow was a watermelon plant, and I was maybe ten years old. I put a seed in the ground, uh -huh. and um, my two-year-old brother stomped on it <laughs> when it came up. I was so sad. <laughs> but. Um, Oh my gosh. My mom had a garden after that in my teenage, during my teenage years. Um, and I helped harvest the rosemary and pick mm. the beets and pick the tomatoes and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. I, and then when I went to college at UC Davis, I got a garden, a garden plot, um, mm. and started growing my own at the student, um, gardens community gardens and uh, found the therapeutic value of gardening yeah. very yeah. quickly. Um, uh, you know, being all, um, you know, discombobulated about some boyfriend or another and 
Mm. going out and building a pea trellis and forgetting all about it for hours on end, you know, <laughs> and just feeling so much better. <laughs> mm. I was like, oh, there's something here. <laughs> so uh -huh. um, I want to start showing the, the water conservation. Uh, one of the reasons we bought the house that we bought are these beautiful rainwater catchment tanks that you can see are catching water from the from the um, gutter there on the roof comes down and goes into this rainwater catchment tank and um, it's it's really wonderful that 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 happens and it uh, fills up the tank and then I can hook a hose to it as you can see I've got a hose that's filling up my compost tea bucket well, or when I turn it on, um, it will fill that up. And this house that we bought came with um, several of these tanks that, that add up to about 250 gallons of rainwater. But there were several gutters that didn't have a tank on them. And so I decided to upgrade the system with dun dun dun. Awesome. These tanks are not as curvaceous and, and you know, aesthetic, but <laughs> this tank, this one tank, which is, which I rigged up to capture water from two downspouts, um, that will capture 275 gallons of water in one tank. And as you can see, it's close to halfway full. And then um, here I have another one. Oh, wow capturing water from there now not all of this in this one is rainwater mm. because i have two more tanks mm. one over here and now every single downspout on our house and we have a, a house and a garage and a shed and every oh. single downspout has a tank on it mm. um, we'll capture every drip of rain that comes down through the downspout into these tanks. And so, but there, I'm also capturing, as you can see right here, this is the pipe that comes out of my washing machine. Mm -hmm. Drains the water. I, um, it goes out into this pipe that I put on the wall and into that tank, which also captures water from the downspout from the shed. So, but as you can see, that tank is empty right now because I hooked up a pump at the bottom and I had to filter it. And I hooked up a pump mm. to the hose mm -hmm. that goes into this hose over here that waters this orchard over there, which I'm not going to take you on a tour of today. We can do that another day. But as you can see, there are many trees right here close by. There are two goji berries. They're not super leafed out yet, so it's kind of hard to see them with the lighting here. I'll take you on a better tour. Those, be those um, pots right over there. It's not very well lit over there, but I've got burdock and elecampane, mm. echinacea, um, and astragalus, and some garlic and some potatoes. So those are all root vegetables that I'm growing in pots to be able to protect the roots. And then there's apricots, peaches, nectarines, apples, pears, mm -hmm and more figs over there. Wow. And you can see that beautiful, um, go over the fence here. You can see that beautiful um, manzanita tree over there that's also making wonderful berries that are medicinal, lovely astringent medicinal berries, nutritious vitamin C bearing berries. And then you can see the raised beds over there where I'm growing arugula and um, more marshmallow is growing over there <laughs> in the raised beds. 
miner's lettuce is all over there, giant miner's lettuce, kale, and China, uh, Napa cabbage, all protected from the frost, but also from the sun. Mm. Um, I tried to, I said, okay, maybe it's not too cold anymore. Um, and I tried to take the frost protective blankets off of them and they started wilting. <laughs> so they didn't like it. It was too hot, too quick, you too know. To do. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is the rainwater system. And now that, that pump requires power and it needs to be plugged directly into the power, but there's no power outlets close enough to these water tanks. So what we have because of the um, power outages that you may have heard about that our power company has been doing to protect from their decrepit under maintained equipment causing the wildfires in the past number of years it's been oh my goodness equipment that has failed in the wind storms of the fall and the summer mm. and fallen over because their connectors were worn out and they hadn't done proper maintenance because they've just been expanding and not tending to maintenance right so we got back up a backup power system which i can show you here uh, so this is the backup power system that um, I can wheel out. You can see it has a, a handle and it has wheels. And I can wheel this battery out to anywhere. And right now it's plugged in with this cord to recharge. Mm. Um, and then I have this special plug that, I, that has a remote control to turn anything that's plugged in here on or off. So when I'm out in the orchard, if the tank is getting too low and the pump is starting to complain because there's not enough water, then um, I can turn it off, turn the pump off with the remote control. And um, so we got that all set up so I can water the orchard without killing the pump because it takes a while to get back. Mm -hmm. the <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and today I had a little bit of a, of a scare about that because um, the pump started to complain and the remote control didn't work because it, it was, I was farther out than, than it mm -hmm. could handle. Like, and so I kind of started running back and I kept pushing the button and then I got close enough and it turned it off. So that mm. was good. Haven't, haven't killed the pump yet, but. <laughs> and I also wanted to show my red tent. Garage spa, bathtub. Oh, wow. And you can see in there, that's the residue from my ginger bath. Last <laughs> Um, that's all ginger powder in there. And Ooh, um, gosh, this, I wish I had the skills to read your, read your tub. That sounds Oh like yeah. Right. Huh? The tea, read the tea leaves at the bottom or the ginger yes. powder at the bottom of the tub. Yes. And so I set up this lovely, um, red tent bathing area in our garage because our little house came with a great orchard, but it didn't come with a bathtub. Um, and so I set this up with a nice red carpet, bath mat. Oh, that's fabulous. Um, yeah. So this is the, the you know, pe some people have a garage band. I have a garage spa. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I just wanted to show that that bathtub also drains out here through this pipe that right now I have it hooked up. Um, to a hose that goes to see that follow that green hose it goes to this fig tree All right here mm. and i don't see any little baby figs on this guy quite yet oh there's one there it is Yay. And I might also, I might also, though the persimmon though, this is another persimmon, it's a little higher up. And so that's gravity fed there to drain to the fig tree. And that's, um, I suppose I could set up gravity feed. I, I think I'm gonna um, clean up this area and put the boneyard of gardening supplies elsewhere and set up sort of a permaculture herb garden in this area. 
right in here downhill from the fig tree. So I have other places to do the gravity feed, other plants to receive the gravity fed water from the, from the bathtub. Mm. So that's in the works. This so. is lovely. I'm excited to finally have a tour. I want to, I want to, I'm looking at our time and I, I was just thinking about taking a few minutes to kind of like wrap up and, and talk a little bit about what this all means because I'm like I'm I'm getting a little bit like overstimulated and overwhelmed with your project and I'm like oh yeah like people <laughs> who are like who have never grown any herbs are going to be like yeah I'm, uh, wh what yeah <laughs> how does this apply to me and so I, I know, you know I just, I, I just want to bring it bring it home into like into like this this is this is big right I mean mm -hmm. And some of this work you didn't do, you you inherited some of it. That's and right. Like, everything that you see, except the herbs that I showed at the beginning, you know, the rosemary and the lady's mantle and all of that, I put those yeah. in the ground. But everything else I purchased already set up. And, and even then, the herbs, the even the herbs that you did bring, that was years of cultivating them. Right. The well, the ladies' mantle was fairly new, um, but it was after years of having grown herbs and feeling confident to be able to, right. you know, order order a live plant online, right. have it, and yeah. be able to pay attention enough to get it at, at the post office or delivered to my home and open it up and be able to, you know, take care of a live plant and keep mm -hmm. it through the season, you know, and yeah. having a system set up and. Yeah, this is years of developing these skills to over 25 years yes yeah I even, I even spent a, a year or two working at, in a land on a landscaping crew mm -hmm. at a local nursery in my uh when i lived in davis mm -hmm. a full-time landscaper for a couple of years so i learned how to um set up drip systems and i learned how to prune fruit trees and roses and i learned how mm. to take care of everything um by being a landscaper where i went and worked on in everybody's yard and, and learned from a professional landscaper how to do all these things so yeah. this is you know yeah. after those years of experience and then i also you know have studied herbology i did a nine month apprenticeship where I learned how to make herbal medicine with a with an herbalist that's pretty well known Cami McBride I met her mm -hmm. at a women's herbal symposium um, many years ago and um, and so I've been practicing making herbal medicine for over 20 years as well and growing my you know various herbs uh, for a long time so yeah this um this is this I guess it's not beginner stuff. <laughs> but we can begin, you know, somebody who's new to growing herbs can begin with, you know, um, it having a, a pot that like even on a balcony in an apartment, having a pot that that you want to grow something in. And a lot of these herbs that I've shown, like calendula, for example, the orange flowers in the raised bed, are they grow like weeds. Some gardeners, yeah. like I, I was a caretaker at a place that had a beautiful garden, lots of raised beds, who forbade me to grow calendula <laughs> because it was such an invasive plant. And once you get it planted, you can't get rid of it because it keeps mm. receding itself mm. and it keeps coming back. Yeah, now, that's not necessarily my experience with calendula. Mm. I would always want more calendula than what's than what mm. I am being able to grow. <laughs> but but that, it, that just shows you how easy it is to grow. And a lot of the herbs um, that I've talked about are that nature. And that's why I became an herb gardener is because it was harder to grow some of the vegetables. Uh -huh. They needed more babying and more tending right. and more careful attention. Yeah, and it is to grow a lot of these herbs will will thrive on neglect. Right. During my busy life, I could grow, I could let the herbs grow. And a lot of them are weeds. Like um, I didn't even mention the crop of what the crops of wild lettuce that I've been eating in salads that are very nutritious yeah. that I have growing in my rose pots here. I'll just show you some of the luscious 
wild lettuce just enclosed. So can you see these mm -hmm. here? And there's all kinds of varieties of wild lettuce. And once mm. you have wild lettuce and you let it go to seed a few seasons, you're going to have <laughs> wild lettuce up the wazoo. Oh, that's fabulous. <laughs> And so yep. it's really easy to grow some of these herbs and they're super nutritious and um, they really help like the, the some of them and I, I'll be writing about this and we'll be sharing about this more. I think this is just sort of an introductory overview for the podcast. And I think what we might wanna do as moving forward is to zero in on one herb at a time. And you and I can just riff on one herb for each podcast, like we started to do with Ladies Mantle today. And I think Ladies Mantle is a great one to start with. And maybe we'll mm. go more in depth with Ladies Mantle next time. How does that sound, Monarda? Yes. Mm hmm. Awesome. That sounds great. Yeah. So I, I like what you said about um, about starting with a pot, right? And, you know, even and, and somebody could buy seeds and you or I could tell somebody what are the easiest seeds to grow. I have, I have a project where I'm getting seeds out to people and a little, and, a, and one step easier is to buy starts from somebody yes. and to put those in or to find them in your community mm -hmm. and to just really start to get to know how plants need care and when, mm -hmm. and, and so starting simple, I, I mean, I didn't start I, I didn't start simple. I started by buying like $250 worth of seed, not knowing what would grow and what would grow. And like half of them wouldn't grow anyways. Um, but then I learned really quickly that I need to, I need to slow down. I need to pace. And then getting to know, you know, getting to know a couple new plants every year really deeply is, is how I've built my, built my wisdom. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I would suggest to somebody is, you know, what's a manageable way to start and choosing a few herbs to start with or medicines. And also, you know, choosing ones in the wild is another option too, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could choose plantain and um, wild chamomile, uh, dandelion, burdock, and start to get to the, know those where you don't even have to take care of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I started with learning how to um, wild harvest. One of the things I started with was wild harvesting various herbs. I learned how to recognize um, St. John's wort, for example, and how to harvest it. And we can talk about that when we have our St. John's wort day. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I learned how to recognize and, and harvest other, other herbs in the wild. Um, and how to honor the ecosystem and honor the herb in the wild and ethically wild crafting. Yeah. Um, so that that might be a wonderful conversation mm -hmm. at some yeah. point. And um, and right now a lot of the things that I showed here, like the wild lettuce, the are are wild herbs that I that most most people would pull out as weeds, but because I recognize the medicinal and nutritional value of these wild plants, I, I let them grow and they really like growing in garden beds. They're used to growing, yes. on, you know, like I can show you the difference at one point when we do, maybe we'll do an episode on um, miner's lettuce, right? We could do an episode on miner's lettuce and look at how the miner's lettuce grows in different environments. Like right now I have these huge lush miner's lettuces growing in the raised beds that are like, I pull up the whole plant and make salad and, you know, put it wow. in like spinach and stuff like that. But then I also have like little, piddly, you know, brown, red, turning red, drying out miner's lettuce with tiny little leaves, spitting out as many seeds as they possibly can in the dried gravel um, mulch, you know, that between the trees that isn't being watered at all and is out in the sun of, on the gravel. And it's just like doing its best to put out one or two seeds, you know, <laughs> so the difference between, you know, how different plants adapt to different wild environments and how we can, um, yeah, nurture them to, to be bigger and more lush and more filled with nutrients. Good, all good topics. 
Yes, oh, I can exactly. go on and on with you about gardening. I'm so excited about this this branch of the of the podcast here, um, the Wound Garden podcast, because um, I love talking gardening. It just brings me so much joy, and we need more. That. That's I feel we need more and more of that in the world today is to be able to experience joy more often and in greater quantities. So. Um, oh let's enjoy together how how's that yeah definitely enjoy your day and okay. let us know if you have any questions whoever is watching or listening to this <laughs> yes please um if you're watching on youtube you can um make a comment in the comments if you're uh listening on the regular podcast um there's not really a comment zone there but what you can do is um, come into the womb centered healing temple Facebook group and Menarda and I are both in there and we will be overjoyed to talk to you about your questions about herb gardening and creating your own womb garden so hope to see you there all right thanks Menarda that's all Hi. For now. until next time <laughs>